morning uh, to all who have uh, decided to join us on this morning. Uh, and for those of you who are just joining or uh, did not hear uh, what Sister Nisha just read and what Pastor was stating about being um, around 12 years in the ministry being uh, being around 12 years, that is quite an accomplishment uh, to do anything uh, for 12 years. It's quite an accomplishment um, to be about the Lord's business for 12 years. And it's a tremendous opportunity and responsibility to be about building the kingdom of God for 12 years. So um, that is a, a great milestone. Um, and as they say, to whom much is given, much is required. And so we are grateful and thankful uh, to still be here. So with that, I say good morning. And I uh, I don't know if I'm excited because we're getting closer to the football season. The Steelers will be in Tampa Bay in a couple of weeks to uh, handle some business, uh, unfortunately, Deke. But uh, I don't know if I'm excited about that. I don't know if I'm excited just because it, it seems that uh, – I'm coming to the end of my fifth week, uh, but I'm excited on this morning. <laughs> That's the word of God. Hey, man. It's a pleasure and an honor to be able to share the word of God time be given the opportunity to do so. So I want to want to speak on this morning from the, the title or the topic of God meets instruments, not influencers. Mm. We've been on for the last four weeks. We've been talking about a, a myriad of things, but fundamentally they're all tied to uh, back to making sure that as we mature in Christ and as we mature um, in in this in this walk and in our salvation and in, in this this life to and desire to be holy, that we are. Are, are moving forward in a way in which God has instructed and in the way in which he designs it. And, and so for one thing we do know about God and the way he, he chose us to walk with him, he wanted us to grow. And growth is a, a, is a, is a responsibility, it's an opportunity, and it's something that is, is a natural thing. And, and so anytime in life, in nature, in human nature, or just as we look around this place called earth, if we, if we come upon something and it is not growing, something is wrong. And, and so I think uh, on this time, I think the, 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 the Holy Spirit is just trying to move us to a place where he's asking us to grow and, and to grow out of uh, some behavior that is somewhat uh, childish and somewhat immature. And so we've been focusing our attention on a few things. We started uh, four weeks ago I guess it would be five weeks ago, uh, talking about uh, the importance of getting control of our emotions. And then we, we went on and we talked about getting control of how we communicate and how we use our mouths. And, and then we got into the, 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 the concept of the thought um, that it, it's, we, we keep at, uh, talking about oftentimes we are waiting on something and we are waiting on God and we're waiting on this. Uh, but we talked about... Uh, from the from the thought process of but what if 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 it's not that God is waiting uh, or isn't are we waiting on God but what if He's truly waiting on us and what if He truly does want to do something miraculous do something powerful in our lives and in our communities but we're not ready and, and so it requires that we get to a point that we are ready so that's the area of growth and then um, last week we talked about. Um, understanding the importance that we live in a world, we live in a society um, that God will judge you based on the totality of your actions uh, in this thing called life. And so we, we know the Bible tells us that we will stand judgment and we would have to give an account for every word spoken, every deed done. However, in this world that we live in, because we are so short of attention and we are, 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 are being it moves so fast, people do not look at the totality of your actions and make a judgment about who you are and whose you are and who you serve. They oftentimes will look at how you react to something and use that to determine who you are and use that to define you. So it's important that in the body of Christ, we be mindful knowing uh, 
that we are under a finer microscope than than, than most who, who don't call themselves to be believers or walker and walkers and believers in Christ that if we are not understanding that how we react to things will oftentimes be the testimony uh, and 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 what will be used to prosecute and convict us and to judge us, we have to be mindful and thoughtful of that when we carry ourselves and we behave in the society in which we live. And, and so on this morning, I think we're going to close talking once again about the importance of uh, what is probably the most important thing now in our society is social media. And, and so one of the big things now is everyone it wants to be, uh, nobody just wants to have a social media footprint, um, but most people now talk about being influencers and everyone has moved into this thing that they want to be influencers. And so the beauty of the Bible is, I don't, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't think we create a lot of new words or even new concepts for that matter. But one of the things that I do know is, is true is um, the word influencer is not in the body and, and it's not in the body of Christ in, from a biblical standpoint. So there's never any, you're not going to find the word or talk about being an influencer that's not in the Bible. Come on, Dave. Preach. And so, but what is in the Bible is he calls us vessels and he calls us, uh, calls us to be instruments. And, and so I want to spend some time kind of just one unpacking. What is an influencer? It's it's a term, we've heard the word influence. This term influencer, uh, though, is, is a relatively new term and it's a new thing that has kind of taken over and it's at the uh, a precipice uh, and move of social media. So I'm going to read uh, I'm going to bore you just reading the definitions and these terms strictly off of an easy internet search. So I'm going to start with uh, Bing.com. Here's how they define an influencer. It says an influencer is a person or organization who has the power to change things or people's minds or to make things happen by inspiring or guiding the actions of others. Influencers have a significant number of followers on social media and use their platform to market various goods and services based on brand partnership. They have specialized knowledge, authority, or insight in specific subjects or fields. Influencers are not marketing tools, but collaborate with the brands to reach marketing objectives and act as a bridge between the brand and consumer. Goes on to say, now this is a this is another definition out of influence of marketing hub.com. It says this: an influencer is someone who has the power to affect the purchasing decisions of others because of his or her authority, knowledge, position, or relationship with his or her audience, a following in a distinct niche with whom he or she actively engages. The size of the following depends on the size of his or her topic of the niche. It is important to note that these individuals are not merely marketing to but rather social, uh, but rather social relationship assets with which brands could collaborate to achieve their marketing objectives. And it goes on to say, uh, goes on to talk about what is a, 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 a social media influencer, but I want to, I want to speak on, I want to talk about this because it starts to talk about how much impact these influencers are having and how fast they're growing. Um, so it says, what is a social media influencer? Over the last decade, we have seen social media grow rapidly in importance. According to most recent statistics, the projected number of global social media users in 2023 is about 5 billion, indicating a rise of about 7% from the previous year. Inevitably, these people look up to influencers in social media to gain them their decision. So what we, what we 
what we learn here, what we just know just based on the definition, um, we just understand that, it, that influence is a powerful tool used to uh, lead and guide and, and help people uh, or at least uh, move people to make certain decisions about how they want to purchase something and how they want to go about uh, doing their business. The last thing I'll read, once again, from the same site says this, influencers in social media are people who have built a reputation for their knowledge and expertise on a specific social media channel and generate large followings of enthusiasts, engage people who pay close attention to their views. Bands, uh, brands love social media influencers because they can create trends and encourage their, encourage their followers to buy products they promote. And so one of the things that you will notice or that I hope jumps out to you uh, when we start talking about an influencer, understand that the influencer is about the, the, the it's about a person. And it's about the fact that at the end of the day, the influencer goes back to who that person is and understand that person is then using their power and their control over a group of people to now lead them to make decisions really from a marketing standpoint about how to purchase things and what they're going to purchase and what's good for purchase. And so the concept of the thought behind the influencer fundamentally first and foremost goes back to putting the importance on the power of the influencer. And so we have to understand that the influencer, the, re the reason influencers are becoming more so, so popular and the re reason people like the thought and concept of the influencer and why it takes on uh, such a popularity is it goes back to putting it about us. And so everybody wants to be an influencer. And the reason that just is so attractive to people is because we like the idea of the thought of being having power and having control over a group of people. And so when you say, well, I want to be an influencer, I just don't want to be a part of something, but I want to be an influencer. What we really are saying oftentimes is I like the fact that I have a following or a group of people who I have power over or control over. And now I'm going to use my power or control to now uh, partner with someone else to drive an agenda, to drive a product, to drive a service. And so the fact that we all can put make a couple changes on our social media applications and we can now call ourselves influencers, we like that. The other thing we like about it is by becoming an influencer, we become an entity that is now a profit our money-making entity. And so we like that. So just about any time in history, you've given a man an option to have power control and money, those things are very, very popular and very, very uh, powerful, and people like them. And the reason people like them is because we are a prideful being by nature. And so if you understand that, if, if you're thoughtful about that, you'll understand why influencers are so important and, and it's so popular and it's growing so, so fast because it feeds everything that by, by nature we are about. Okay. And so the only problem uh, with this is there's nothing wrong with influ influencers when we start talking about as the definition says, it's about marketing and it's about goods and services. And so fundamentally, there's nothing wrong with that. And if used in the right setting, being an influencer is not a bad thing. I think the problem, however, is we in the body of Christ have gotten confused into thinking God needs us to be influencers. 
And God doesn't need us to be influencers. Come on now, be preach. He calls us or asks us to be an influencer. He is the influencer. Hmm. He doesn't need us to sell him. That's, that's not what he asked us to do. What he asked us to do was just speak about him. And he says, this is scripture. He says, I will draw all men unto me. Well, now, the problem is, man. the influencer is about I drawing people unto him. And so we have to be very careful that we don't get into an influencer mindset when we start talking about the work in which we're doing because God is not a good or a service to be sold. That's not what he is. H. And so we, we, we understand that the, the value or influencer must create a buzz. We, we understand that they are they, they provide click break bait in order for you to click on something that they want to take your attention to or take you to follow. And we understand that they are required to come up with hot takes and hot topics to draw you in and to get your attention. And so understand that even though the Bible doesn't talk about influencers, understand that even the Bible tells us that we must be careful of the power of influence. So uh, if you go to the book of Proverbs, in Proverbs chapter uh, 13, verse 20 says this. He says this in, in the book. Solomon says, he that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion uh, of fools shall be destroyed. So once again, the Bible doesn't talk about influencers, but the Bible appreciates the power of influence. So even Solomon says, hey, if you put yourself around wise people, you'll be wise. But he says, but if you take on the companion of fools, I didn't say it. Solomon says that you shall be destroyed. My Lord. Then if we go to Proverbs chapter 22, verses 24 through 25, it says this, proud and, ha proud and haughty scorners in his name who dealeth in proud wrath. And so once again, we find ourselves here, Solomon is, is uh, and I'm, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I was reading 21 there, but it, it, it brings the point uh, of, about us being haughty and prideful. So he cautions, and, and Solomon uh, talks about this quite often, that we have to be very careful because we are a prideful group. We are a prideful bunch. And we have these high, you know, the Bible tells us, don't think highly of, of yourself that you ought. Right. Amen. So the, the counter to, to th thinking too highly of yourself is to be prideful, also have a faulty spirit. Uh, and so the Bible says, be careful. Proverbs 22, uh, verse 24 and 25 says this. It says, make no friendship with an angry man uh, and with a, uh, a furious man who, uh, who shall not go. Least thou learn his ways and go a snare, uh, to be a snare to thy soul. So understand, once again, we start talking about who we're making friends with and how we can be influenced. So in this case, he's saying, Hey, don't put yourself around angry people uh, because you can be influenced by. It. And so if the Bible appreciates it, understands the, the power influence has over us, once again, still don't have influencers per se, but it understands the power of influence. I'll, I'll close with the, if we go to the first Corinthians, uh, I'll close on this, this topic, uh, I should say. If we go to first Corinthians chapter 15, Verses 33 through 34, Bible says this, and this is New Testament. It says this, be not deceived. Evil communication corrupt good manners. Yes. Awake to righteousness and sin not. For some have not the knowledge of God. Hmm. I speak this to your shame. 
But once again, Paul here in the church of Corinth is once again <clears throat> warning the people not to be deceived. Because he understands the power of influence. And so now we get ourselves into situations where we have people when we're in a society that teaches you have to be an influencer or people who have bought into the, to the thought that in order for people to be saved, healed, delivered, and set free, they need to be influencers. Not God, but they need to be the influencer. They have to, you have to understand the way this works is you have to make uh, things that get people's attention. And you have to say things and do things that get people's attention. So that is why we see people who have taken on this concept, thought, or idea of being influencers, that's how you get statements that say things like 85% of Jesus' life was out of order. Oh, you better preach. Preach now. Come on, baby. So it says, you know, he was anointed, he was called, he was chosen, but he was wrong. Come on now. Come on. And so you understand they are doing this because they have taken on the mindset and the thought that they need to do things that get people's attention. Crazy stuff. In some way to the word of God. The only problem is oftentimes what these people are saying, and, and, and some of them are doing it thoughtfully, and some people are just foolish, but they are saying things and doing things to bring attention as a shock value because they think once again they have to do something to get people's attention because they have to be the influence. Well, we know that the Bible is very clear. And for the sake of time, I'm not gonna, gonna go in, into all these, but we know that the Bible says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, the Bible is very clear. In verse 31, it says this. It says, whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Yes. So there are two ways. That God, that Jesus could have lived 85% of his life out of order because he understands all that he does is to the glory of God. To yes. the glory of God. Come on now. That's 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 the word, that's the word of God. That's and, the word of God. Go to um so, if you go to uh, Psalms, once again we find the psalmist here. David says it a little bit even, even cleaner than that. Psalm chapter 37. Word of God says this, uh, chapters uh, 30, uh, the chapters, I mean, chapter 37 or book 37, uh, verse 23 and 24 says this, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord oh. and delighted in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the mm -hmm. Lord upholdeth him with his hand. So understand there is no way that any, if, if, if God sent Jesus Christ, his son, to earth, and he ordered his steps, you cannot make a statement that says 85% of Jesus' life or his steps were out of order. This contradiction to the word of God. This is a contradiction to what we know. Absolutely. But again, it gets people's attention. An influencer or somebody with an influencer mindset makes a statement that says the black church owes the LBGTQ community an apology. Mm. Well, you have to understand, once again, people make statements like this because they feel like they have to be influencers and they have to say things that get people's attention. But we understand and we know that we have a Bible that tells us whether we like it or not, whether it makes us comfortable or not, the Bible is very clear and it says it and Paul says it and he was uh, in what most, even, even people that don't believe in God would tell you, would, would say that the, the, the plight of not just the United States, but many uh, major power uh, countries and, and, and societies aligned to, to what happened to Rome, Romans chapter one, verse 26, is very clear. It says, for this cause, God gave them up to vile affliction. For even their women 
did change the natural use that which, uh, that which is against nature. And likewise, also men leaving the natural use of their, of their women burned in their lust one towards another, men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving themselves uh, that recompense of their error which was met. Verse 28, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to reprobate minds. Reprobate minds. Things which were not convenient. Being mm -hmm. with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murderers, debaters, deceiters, malignant whisperers, backbiters, he goes on to identify. Mm -hmm. Yes, but sir. One of the things you understand, he talks about sexual morality. Yes. So why would the church owe anybody in any community an apology Come on now. that is operating in sexual morality? We wouldn't apologize to a man no, who indeed. on his wife or, or who was having an extramarital affair or we wouldn't, we wouldn't apologize to a community that is having sex outside of marriage. We wouldn't apologize to them. So why would we apologize to this community? This is utter blasphemy. And understand this is this is talk that once again says that because I have power and control over people, and since they believe that God is a product or a service, they believe he must be sold. And so they believe that their influence must be used in order to move the people. But understand, once again, God is not a good a service. And once again, God does not need us. God is the influence. So yes. he doesn't need us to have our power or control to lead any people anywhere. We have to be very clear about this. For the sake of time, I won't read any, any more scripture on this. But you could, you could go to uh, 1 Timothy. Chapter chapter one, verses eight through eleven, it talks about sexual morality and talks about how that is is is, is very damning. Um, first Corinthians chapter six, verse fifteen through sixteen talks about it. In the book of Mark, and I, I'll go to Mark because it's it always yeah, yeah, yeah. let's let's just yes, go to yes, Mark. Yes, yes, yes. Let's go to Mark. Mark chapter seven, verse twenty through twenty three says this. And this is Jesus speaking. And it says, and he said, think which cometh out of the man that defileth the man. For from within, out of the hearts of men proceedeth evil, thoughts, adulteries, fornication, murders, thefts, covetedness, wickedness, deceitfulness, of uh, uh, lasciviousness and evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolish. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. So this is Jesus speaking. Yes. He lists some things there. One of, one of the things you can't deny that he lists is sexual morality. Understand if Jesus says these things come from the hearts of men, from within him, I don't think Jesus would apologize for saying or tell anyone that is a believer of his to go apologize to a community that promotes the things that he said, be careful of. Come on, they preach. And so we have to be very careful and thoughtful. If, if anyone makes a statement and says we should do that, understand something is amiss because it doesn't line up with the word of God. If you want to read uh, uh, more about it, even in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 8, talks about understanding sexual morality and how it doesn't align with the word of God. Once again, what you may hear from an influencer or someone with an with a influencer, influencer mindset as it comes to, uh, comes to, the, to, to God and the relationship of God and growing the kingdom, they'll make a statement that says, once saved, always saved. Now understand that doesn't line up with the scriptures, but it is something 
that attracts a lot of attention. And it is something that moves people. And so once again, when you're an influencer, your job is to move people based on the power and influence you have over them. And so uh, once again, we get a statement that says once saved, always saved. Hmm. But we get a Bible that doesn't align with those things. And so go to go to Matthew. I, I want to go a couple places. I'll tell you what, let's start in the, in the books. Nobody likes to read, apparently, but Revelation chapter three. Revelation chapter three. And, and, and we won't read all these scriptures because there are a few and there are many and we don't have time. But Revelation chapter three says this. Revelation three, and we'll start at verse uh, 12. And it says this, this is in the red in my Bible, Revelation 3, 12 says, him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of, of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, um, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my name. So understand, here we, we have in the red saying, he that overcometh. So this concept of once saved, always saved, would then say, why are we talking about overcoming in the book of Revelation? Because once saved, always saved, I don't have to overcome anything. But understand that once saved, always saved is not biblically or scripturally correct. Come on, Dean. The Bible also wouldn't talk about the falling away if the once saved, once saved, always saved doctrine was correct. It's a popular doctrine. It's a likable doctrine. But understand it does not align with the word of God. Amen. So the, Flip to verse 21. He says this, same, same book, Revelation 3, verse 21 says, to him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in, on my, uh, in my throne, even as I also overcome and am set down with my father in his throne. So even if you go back to Jesus, and you say, well, Jesus was baptized and he was baptized in the Holy Ghost. So he was saved. But he says, even as I overcame. But what did Jesus overcome? He overcame sin. And so to think that we are going to be able to just uh, accept Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, and then go live a life any kind of way we want to. Come on, and you got to preach. Understand. That is a doctrine that, while may be popular, say it, man, say it, correct. But it's good influencer material. Mm -hmm. uh, if it, and for the sake of time, I'll give you some scriptures to to, to more uh, go into the whole concept of once saved, always saved, and how that does not align with the scriptures. If you go to First John chapter uh, two, verse uh, four. You can go to uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 14. We looked at Matthew 19, 25 through 26. You can go to John chapter 16, verse 7. You can go to Acts chapter 2, verse 38. And you can go to Acts chapter 5, verse 32. And they will let you know that once saved, always saved, does not align with the scriptures. Now, an influencer will also make a statement that would say something like this. God is love. So he would not allow anything evil like hell. There is no hell. Mm -hmm. now? But once again, that does not align with the scriptures. But it is popular. It is a likable message. It is something that would drive and influence a lot of people. It is a lie. And it's 
clickbait and it gets people's attention, but understand it's not biblical. Matthew chapter 25, verse 41 says this. Then shall he say unto them on the left hand, depart from me, ye cursed unto everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. So you are right to say, well, uh, Jesus or God would have never uh, designed hell or made hell. No, he didn't design it or make it for you. Let's be very clear about that. He made it for the devil and his angels. That's who he made it for. But understand also that you play a role in deciding if you want to join them there. And so we cannot blame God or blame Jesus or use that love as an excuse to say, I can go live a life that is opposite of the teaching. And because he loves me so much, he won't allow me to go to a place that he designed for the devil and his angels. That doesn't align with the scripture. Go to Revelations chapter uh, 20. We'll go back to Revelations. Revelations chapter 20. And we'll start at verse 12. And it says this. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were open. And another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of these things, which were written in the books according to their works. And the seas gave up the dead, which were in it, and the death of hell delivered up the dead, which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. So understand, let's not blame or use or try to, to, to say, well, God loves me so much. Jesus is love and he loves me so much that what I do, what I do and how I live my life and the things that I go about doing, he says, your works, you're going to have to answer for them. You're going to have to give an account for the way in which you did things. Mm. Come on now. And so it would be a fallacy. It would be a misconception to tell somebody that there is a gospel. Oh, there could be a gospel. But the gospel of Jesus Christ in no way says that God loves you so much that there is no hell or that you can't go there. Right. That's not biblical. And it's not. That, might, that might be. That's an emotional feel good story. That makes me feel better. Uh, either about me or about people that I know and people that I love and maybe even people that have passed away before me that might make me feel better. But it doesn't line up with scripture. I'm not going to, uh, you can go see 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. It talks about this concept also, but for the sake of time, we will not, uh, we will not uh, venture there. The other thing you might hear from somebody who is bought into this influencer role and who must create clickbait and, and do things that, that, that get people emotionally involved, they may make a statement that says, well, you don't need a pastor or to go to church. Mm. Break it on down deep. However, that doesn't align with the scriptures. Go to Jeremiah. Chapter three, and whether we like it or not, there is a way in which God does it. And since he says he can't be a liar, he couldn't say these things and then totally blow them up later because that would make him out to be a lie. So, Understand in Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 15 through 17, it says this, and I will give you pastors according to my heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding, 
And it shall come to pass when ye be multiplied and increase in the land in these days or in those days, uh, saith the Lord, they shall say no more, the ark of the covenant of the Lord, neither shall it come to mind, neither shall it they remember it, neither shall they visit it, neither shall uh, they uh, be done anymore. And, and, and verse 17 says, at that time, they shall call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord, and all the nations shall be gathered into it to the name of the Lord to Jerusalem, neither shall they walk any more after the imagination of their evil hearts. Oh. <clears throat> so understand the book of Jeremiah, and I know somebody gonna say, well, that's the Old Testament. Well, we'll, we'll get you one verse in the New Testament. But understand God had pastors. Mm -hmm. He's called for them to be pastors. He doesn't want us off being loose cannons. He says there needs to be some guidance. There needs to be some leadership. Go to Acts chapter 20, verse 28. It says this. Take heed therefore unto ourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. So understand, even in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, when the Holy Ghost is present, he says they're going to be overseers. And he says, you're going to be held at a higher accountability because of who you are. Oh, now. But understand, there will be pastors, there will be overseers. As much as we don't like to have anybody over us, I hate to tell you, but God has designed it that we all have covering. Someone has to be over. That's the way he designed it. Now, this thing about not going to church. According to the scripture, if you go to the book of Hebrews, the book of Hebrews is pretty clear about this. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 through 25, and it says this, and let us consider one another, um, and, well, I don't know if I gave this, this is Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 and 25, and let us consider one another to provoke unto love uh, to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting, uh, exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So I hate to tell you, but the concept right now of saying people don't need to go to church anymore this would be a direct contradiction of what the Bible says, because it says in the day of the, as the day is approaching, oh, yeah. it says you need to be assembling more. It's not a popular message, not maybe one that people like, but it's biblically sound. Another influencer message or topic or statement you may hear is, just be good because God is good. Understand, be not fooled. This is not biblical. Understand, being good has nothing to do with being saved, has nothing to do with needing Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior and has nothing to do with understanding that the requirement is not that you be good, but the requirement is that we be holy. That's why he says, be ye holy for I am holy. Yes. Amen. I say, 
be ye saved because I am saved. He did not say be ye good because I am good. He says be ye holy. And understand if you are holy and if you are attracted and trying to drive towards holiness, the byproduct of that is understand that you can only be holy through Jesus Christ. And if you are attaching yourself to holiness, the byproduct of that is you would then be saved automatically because you, you would have to accept Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, in order to even venture into being holy. But in nowhere will you find it anywhere that Jesus says, be good. He says, be ye holy, for I am holy. Oh, my God. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2. And um, we'll read, we will just read one of these. But Ephesians chapter 2. Verse eight and nine says uh, eight you know, eight and nine. It says says this. For by grace ye are saved through faith, that not of ourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man boast. So once again, you being good has nothing to do with the fact that you're saved because in order to be saved, understand you have to accept Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior. And the yeah. only person that can save you is Jesus. So you have to accept him. So just because you're a good person, that's admirable. However, it has nothing to do with your salvation. Amen. It has nothing to do with, with we being brothers and sisters in Christ. You're just a, you're just a nice person. Just a good person. That doesn't make you a saved person. Doesn't make you a holy person. Just makes you a good person. But I would also say, make sure you read the scripture too, that when Jesus, when he was called good master, he says, why do you call me good? He says, there is none good but the Father. Amen. So if you don't align yourself with the teachings and the responsibilities of the Father, guess what? You can't be good either in the eyes of God. Just the way he wrote it. That's his, that's his requirement, that's not mine. And so once you get to the understanding that, uh, and if you wanna also read a scripture about understanding why just being good isn't good enough, uh, Ecclesiastes chapter seven, verse 20. Uh, speaks to that Solomon does there. Uh, but we have to understand God is not looking to be sold. He is not a product or service. He doesn't need us to sell him. What God desires is not for us to be his salespeople, not for us to be his influencers. He doesn't want that. What God desires us to be and what God desires is to be worshipped. That's what he desires, not to be sold. He desires to be worshipped. Amen. And the reason he does not call us influencers, but he uses a different term. He says, what I need you to be is I need you to be instruments. Oh, not be. And so the definition, and this is once again, uh, all credit going to Bing.com. This is the definition of an instrument. It says an instrument can have different meanings depending on the context. It can be a device used to produce music or musical sound. It can be a mechanical implement or tool for precision work, a tradable asset, or a negotiable item in finance a measuring device for determining the value of a quantity or a written legal document. It can also be an important factor or agency in something or an object used to perform some task or action. And so the reason the Bible talks about, it talks about us 
and, and the concept of being an instrument is the instrument has nothing to do with itself. As a matter of fact, an instrument is absolutely useless until someone uses it. Right. Uses it. Uh -huh. Yes, sir. It has nothing to do with you. And so the Bible says you are to be instruments, meaning God wants to use you to do his work. Come on, man. Preach. And so he doesn't need us to influence. He doesn't care about us. We have no power. He is the power. He says, when I, if you make, get to a point where I can use you, I can pick you up and use you as an instrument to do my work, that's what I need. Yes. The problem is, we got a lot, but one of the problem is we don't want to be instruments. We want to be influencers. We want to be in control. We want the focus, the dot, the attention to be on us, not God. And so we want to be influenced. God says, I don't need any more influence. We have a world full of them. They're growing at 7% a year, and, and you guys are running off to be them. So we, we got to even question now, God now has to compete because we'd rather be influencers for the business selling goods and service. We don't have really time for him, so that's a concern. But also, he don't want us to be influencers because he don't need us to influence anything. He needs us to be instruments so he can pick us up and use us to do his work. Preach, Deacon. Deacon Naaman, preach. And so he says, I need you to be a device that I can pick up and I can use to play music, use for sound. I can use it to be a, a, a tool that can, can bring precision to the body. Or maybe I could use you as a tradable or negotiable asset. And so un understand, not about you, but once again, I need you to talk about my son, Jesus Christ, because he is the tradable or negotiable asset that has been used to finance. And so he's paid the price. You have it. I need you to talk about him, not talk about you. Amen. And then he says, I need you, uh, if we want to start talking about an uh, 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 instrument being used to determine the value of or quantity of something, he says, I know what the value is. I've said it. He said the value or the quantity of who you are is the fact that I gave my life for you. Yes. Thank you. Lord. I just need you to be the instrument that can be used to explain that to people. Mm. I don't need you to be the focus. I need you to be the instrument. And if you want, if I want to use you to talk about the written legal document, he says, I wrote a Bible. Come on, Dick. And so I don't need you to do anything. That's why he says, I don't want you to add anything to it or take anything away from it. He's wrote the document. Come on. He says, just give them the document. Don't change the document. Use that word. Don't correct the English. I don't want you to change anything. Don't take out stuff that could hurt people's feelings. Wow. Changing it. Preach. Give them the document. That's what I need you to do. But the problem is we are so busy being influencers and we as an influencer have to take into account losing our power and control. So what we say is, well, because I'm an influencer, God, I'm not an instrument. Let me fix the word to deal with my constituents. Mm. But that's, he don't want influencers. Though. He said, I just need you to be an instrument. I just need you to be in a position to be used to share my gospel, not your gospel. Oh, yeah. About you. Oh, yeah. Now, I know we don't like the Book of Mormon, 
But in the Book of Mormon, they have a book in there uh, uh, called Alma. And I, I, I like this. This is what it says. Alma chapter 26, verse 3 says this. Behold, I answer for you, for your brethren, the Lamanites, uh, were in darkness. Ye even in the darkness of this. But behold, how many of them are brought to behold the marvelous light of God? And this is the blessing which hath been bestowed upon us, that we have been made instruments in the hands of God to bring about the great work. He says, we have been made instruments. We're usable instruments that can be used to do the work of God. So you say, well, I don't know. Under, do you understand Jesus was an instrument? That's yes, why he. Yes, yes, yes. He always said, I am here doing the work of who? Not me. Father. I'm not the influencer. He says, I'm doing the work of my father. I'm just allowing myself to be an instrument. In him only. Come on now. But many times we want to be the influencer, not the instrument. Understand that is a problem. Uh, go to Acts chapter 9, verse. Uh, we'll, we'll, go to, we'll go to Acts 9, 15 uh, really quickly. And then we got to get into the Bible shows us the difference between an influencer and an instrument. All right. Acts chapter nine, verse 15 says this, Jesus speak. But the Lord said unto him, go thy way, for thy is a chosen vessel unto whom to bear my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the children of Israel. Does anybody have a different translation uh, than I'm reading King James? Anybody have something different than King James? And if you do, could you please read Acts chapter 9, verse 15? Okay, I'll get it for you. Um, Acts chapter 9, verse 15. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. So Acts 9, 15 in the uh, New Living Translation says, but the Lord said, go for Saul, go, for Saul is my chosen instrument to take my he name his to the Gentiles. What did he call them? He called them his chosen what? His chosen instrument. Calls him his chosen instrument. Go ahead, I'm sorry, keep reading. Do you find, go, for, go, for Saul is my chosen instrument, instrument to take my message to the Gentiles and to kings, as well as the, to the people of Israel. And I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. Now, this is Jesus speaking. It's in the red. It's in the red. He didn't ask Saul. He said he's my chosen instrument. The mind. Once again, bringing back attention, not about Saul. It's not about you, not about me. Well, he's looking for his instrument because he said, if you just be an instrument, I can use you to do what I need to do. Uh, Second Timothy, for the sake of time, we won't go there. But pastor, I do want to read this because it's just as important. Can you... Get the Message Bible, and can you get First Peter, chapter uh, two? And I want to read nineteen, uh, nine through nineteen, but I want it out of the Message Bible. First Peter, chapter two, nine through nineteen. So ten, ten okay. verses. The, there is another. No, I we won't read it for the sake of time. We'll we'll let Pastor read. Uh, First Peter, but if you go to Second Timothy chapter two verses twenty through twenty one, it's going to talk about the fact of us being his instruments, his chosen vessel. 
Now, uh, Pastor, if you got it, can you read First Peter chapter two, verses nineteen, uh, verses nine through nineteen, out of the Message Bible? Okay. So it's kind of hard to tell which verse it is in the Message Bible, but I'm thinking it says, "Present yourselves as building stones for the construction of a sanctuary vibrant with life, in which you serve as holy priests." Offering Christ approved lives up to God. The scriptures provide precedent. Look, I am setting a stone in Zion, a cornerstone in the place of honor. Whoever trusts in this stone as a foundation will never call, will never have cause to regret it. To you who trust him, he's a stone to be proud of, but to those who refuse to trust him, the stone. The workman throughout is now the chief foundation stone for the untrusting. It's a stone to trip over, a, a boulder blocking the way. They trip and fall because they refuse to obey just as predicted. But you are the ones chosen by God, chosen for the high calling of priestly work, chosen to be a holy people, God's instruments to do his work, and speak out for him to tell others of the night and day difference he made for you. From nothing to something, from rejected to accepted. Friends, this world is not your home, so don't make yourselves cozy in it. Don't indulge your ego at the expense of your soul. Live an exemplary life among the natives so that your actions will refute their prejudices. Then they'll be won over to God's side and be there to join in their celebration when he arrives. Make the master proud of you by being good citizens. Respect the authorities, whatever their level. They are God's emissaries for, for keeping order. It is God's will that by doing good, you might cure the ignorance of the fools who think they are in, they're a danger to society. Exercise your freedom by serving God, not by breaking the rules. Treat everyone you meet with dignity. Love your spiritual family. Revere God. Respect the government. Thank you. I think you said the word in there, chosen instruments to speak. Yes. And so once again, he's saying the same about you. You ain't the cornerstone. Go this ain't about you. I don't need you to influence anyone. I need you to let me be the influencer. I just need you to be the instrument. Then I'll do all, I'll do the rest of it. And so, but once again, he talks there about. Don't change my word. Don't change my message. But see, when you're an influencer, because your power and control is governed and based off of how many people you control, you can't be used truly by God because your message, and I should say his message, won't be popular with all the people. So when you start factoring in the people and the power that you have, you'll get tripped up. That's why he talks about in his Bible, the cornerstone will trip you up. You'll get tripped up about really what you can promote and what you can say because your power and control is built up off people. And you right. got to worry about people. And to bring this all back to a very clear picture, you got to worry about people who God created in his likeness, who are emotional. Mm -hmm. And so because you don't want to infringe on their emotions and their feelings, you have to now make a choice between their feelings and God's word. Right. And so usually because we're influencers and not instruments, we will side with the emotions and feelings of the people who give us the power. 
And so that's why he doesn't like influence. He says, I need instruments. Because instruments don't care who picks them up to play them. Mm. They just make a sound. Mm. Which is why the chief musician was none other than Satan. The reason Satan had to be replaced is because he was the chief musician. He is going to make a sound. The problem was, God understood he wasn't going to make his sound. And so he had to replace the musician. Wow. Mm -hmm. And so same thing with us. We sometimes get so focused on our influence and the fact that we think we have to be influencers for God that once again, we start and he can't use us because we're not making his sound anymore. We're making the sound that appeals to our power, which is the people that we have influence and control over. So he steps away from us because he can't use us. Because when he gives us word or he gives us his word, we will doctor it up to deal with our constituency to make sure we keep our power. And so that's why he don't, he don't really mess with us too much. He don't mess with us influencers. He said, I'm looking for some instruments. Now, I think what we have gotten this confused is the book of Proverbs. We've heard, probably heard it before. And we are coming to a close here in a few scriptures. Book of Proverbs, chapter 11, verse 3 says this. I think we got this confused. It says, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. And he that winneth souls is wise. And so I think what we have gotten confused in is we think when we talk about winning souls and being wise, we say, well, we got to be smart enough to trick them so we can slide in the word of God. Because that's what influence. I get control of a set of people and then I will give them a message and based on the fact that I have built a constituency and a, and, a, and a level of respect and a level of relationship with them, I can give them any message to pretty much I want and they will accept it. So we feel like, we use in this scripture incorrectly, feel like we got to be wise to win souls. So we say, I just can't give them, the, I just can't give them the word of God. I, I got to fix it. I got I to gotta clean it up first. To trick them, I got to be wise, got to be thoughtful, trick them so I can pull them in, and then I'm going to show them what the real word of God says. But understand, once again, that's us, because once again, we think it's about us. And so we want to be in control of the winning of the soul. He said, nope, I just need you to be an instrument. I don't need you to, I don't need you to influence. I don't need you doing anything tricky. Don't, don't do that. That's not what I asked you to do. Amen. He said, I just need you. To, I'm just looking for an instrument. You, you, if you be the instrument, I'll take care of the rest. Don't need you to be cute. Daniel chapter, Daniel chapter 12 says this. Daniel chapter 12, verse three. He says, he says, and they, that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and that they and they, uh, that they turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. So he says, Daniel, he says here, for they that be wise. Well, okay, he says they that be wise. We just Proverbs said that it takes a wise one to win souls. Let's just say that he said the ones that are wise, he says they shall uh, shine brightness with firmament and they that uh, turn many to righteousness as the stars ever and ever. He said, you're going to be an important person if you're a wise person. Proverbs 
1130 says, wise people win souls. But then we get 1 Corinthians. And when we start talking about what makes a person wise, the Bible tells us what makes a person wise. Spoiler alert, it's going to be Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. Now I praise you, brethren, that ye remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I deliver them to you. Once again, he don't need you to be an influencer. He needs us to be instruments. He'll take care of it because all the delivering can come through him. He don't need you to be cute. He don't need you to be tricky. He says, what I need you to do is I need you to remember me in all things. Keep the ordinances as I deliver them to you. So once again, you ain't controlling. I'm the one that's going to deliver the people to you. But it's about me, not about you. First Corinthians chapter, the back up one second here. Now. First, first Corinthians chapter 10, uh, 30, 32 and 33 says this. Just up a, up a, up a, a few verses. It says, give, no, give none offense neither to the Jews or the Gentiles nor the, nor the church of God. Even as I please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many that they may be saved. So Paul Amen. is explaining that this is not about me. He says, I might have a relationship with all men, um, but he says, not seeking my own profit. Mm -hmm. Influencers are about prophets. Wow. They are prophets. That's right. He says, I'm not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many that I may, that they may be saved. Paul is explaining to the church of Corinth, praying about building up a whole lot of relationships with people. That's not important to me. That's what's not profitable to me. This is about saving souls. And then he says in verse 31, whether therefore ye eat or drink, whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Once again, this ain't about you. All about God. That's the influence. You're the instrument. He's the influence. He will give his message through you. You got no play in it other than are you willing to be an instrument? It's all he needs to know. He'll take it from there. So I want to I want to want to close up here identifying in the scripture the difference between an influencer and an instrument. And we we'll find it in none other than our good friend Paul. Paul here is he is an instrument, and we're gonna talk about how he is an instrument. But I want you to listen to what Paul is saying here. And this is chapter 2 of uh, 2 Corinthians. Uh, and I want to do 2 uh, Corinthians. And I just want to actually, um, I want to go 2 Corinthians first. I think I'll do 2 Corinthians first. And we're going to come back to our good friend. Uh, I want to do 2 Corinthians 10.10. 10, and we're going to come back to somebody that's an influence. Because there is a, there is a difference. Uh, so I think I want to go 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 10. And it says, he says for this, for his letters say they are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech is contemptible. So understand Paul here. Understand Paul wasn't the most eloquent of guys. He was writing some heavy stuff. He had a heavy message. But he wasn't charismatic. It didn't come across in a way that was necessarily, uh, he didn't have a, the greatest of speech or, or orientation. He wasn't some great order. 
He was just a man speaking a heavy word. And so fast forward to today, because we have to be entertained, we are choosing those who accept to accept the word of God and be the mouthpiece of God based on their presentation. On, but they might not have a heavy word. Mm -hmm. But once again, it makes it very clear that Paul, he, he, he had heavy and powerful words, but his bodily presence was weak. He didn't, he didn't dress a certain way. He wasn't a, he wasn't the most ripped guy in the in the pulpit. That wasn't his word. That wasn't his that wasn't him. He didn't look like much. And the words say he didn't sound like much. But it says he had a heavy, weighty, powerful word. Now, oh, come on, D. You brought that out. Let's go over, and now let's go over and look in the book of Acts for a minute, and let's close in the book of Acts. We, we find in the book of Acts some things that are pointed out. Here's what we know about Paul, because, and, and we know about the 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 those that are instruments. Let's go to let's go to uh, let's start in seventeen, Acts chapter seventeen, verse two. And it says this, and Paul, who we just heard that had a heavy word, weighty word, but he didn't look very good. He didn't look like the strongest guy. He didn't wear the nicest of clothes. He didn't have the greatest of speech. Says this, and Paul as his manner was, went in unto them and uh, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the scriptures. Paul say, I'm going on the word. I'm sticking with the influencer. I'm just merely letting the influencer use me as an instrument to go reason with these people. Then it says in verse three, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead and that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. For some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas and of the devout Greeks, a great multitude and of the chief women, not a few. So understand, Paul said, I'm just coming here. I'm going to give you the word. And I'm going to sit down and I'm going to reason with you. I'm going to give you scriptures. I'm going to stay with you three days. And I'm going to show you that this ain't about me. This is about Jesus Christ. Amen. Go to, go to, uh, flip back to Acts chapter 16, verse 17. So Acts chapter 16, verse 17, and it says this, and some at the same followed Paul and us and cried saying, these men are the servants of the most high God, which show unto us the way of salvation. The same weak, not well-spoken instrument is being used to save people. He's given them the influencer. He's merely being the instrument. Acts chapter 18, verses 4 through 12 says this. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. And when Silas and Timothy uh, were come uh, from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. Amen. Now Paul, he's strictly sticking to his message and about Jesus Christ. And when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his remnant and said unto them, your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From henceforth, I will go Unto the Gentiles. And he yeah. departed this.
and entered into a certain man's house uh, named uh, Justus, or Justus, one that worshiped God, whose house joined hard to the synagogue, or maybe your Bible doesn't talk about it being joined, um, but understand it was next door uh, to the synagogue. And then it says he went to the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house. And many of the uh, the, the uh, uh, Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night of his vision, be not afraid, but speak and hold not thy peace. For I am with thee and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in this city. Once again, because Paul was weak, wasn't well spoken, he stuck to his script. It's about Jesus Christ. I'm here speaking the word of God. I'm merely an instrument. And God says, because you have shown true to be an instrument, and I know I can use you as an instrument. He assures Paul by giving him a vision to say, don't trip. These people, you didn't base your power. You didn't base your, your, your value on how many people you had uh, under your influence. You pointed you from the start. You pointed everybody back to me. So I got your back. Amen. So you ain't got to worry about what you're saying, what you're teaching. I got your back. I have you covered. Uh, same chapter, Acts chapter 18. Um, and we go to verse 13. Once again, it says this. Saying this, fellow pers persuadeth men to worship God contrary to the law. So once again, Paul goes and he's persuading people. Not because he's debonair, he's smooth, he's attractive. Not by how he looks. And he don't speak well. He just giving them words. That's all he's giving them. Amen. And he's persuading and people away from the law. Just giving them words. Just being an instrument. Not doing anything over, overly. He's not doing some big deal. Verse 19. And he came to Ephesus and left them there. But he himself entered into the synagogue and reason with the Jews. He don't care where you put them. He don't care whether you put them around Jews or Gentiles or kings or whoever you put him around. Paul said, I got one message. Jesus Christ. Amen. He is the Lord and Savior. He is the Christ. That was his message. He didn't do anything cute. He wasn't trying to build some big social media footprint. I'm just giving them words. That's all I'm doing. I don't have nothing else. I don't look good. I don't talk very well. I'm not, I can't fight everybody out here. Only thing I can do is give them word. And the fact that Jesus said, hey, as long as you do what I told you to do, you give them the word, I got you. That's all he, that's what he was leaning on. Now, we got to go. To 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 uh, Paulus, and we we out of here. So I'm a pastor. If I could borrow you, uh, because I know you'll have a, 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 whether you uh, I know you can do it out of message, or you can use your uh, your other translation. It's not King James that you normally uh, will, will talk from. If I could get you to read Acts chapter 18 verses 24 through 28. Okay. So we still in at Book of Acts. We ain't left it. We in Acts chapter eighteen, chapter twenty four through twenty eight. And what translation are you reading from? New Living Translation. New Living. Let's see what New Living got to say. Meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, an eloquent speaker who knew the scriptures well, had arrived in Ephesus from Alexandria in Egypt. He had been taught the way of the Lord, and he taught others about Jesus with an enthusiastic spirit and with accuracy. However, he knew only about John's baptism, 
And Priscilla and Aquila heard him preaching boldly in the synagogue. They took him aside and explained the way of God even more accurately. Apollos had been thinking about going to Archia, and the brothers and sisters in Ephesus encouraged him to go. They wrote to the believers in Archia, asking them to welcome him. When he arrived there, he proved to be a great benefit to those who, by God's grace, had believed. He, re he refuted the Jews with powerful arguments and public debate. Using the scriptures, he explained to them that Jesus was the Messiah. Amen. So now we find an influencer here. Because the Bible tells us that Apollos, born, he was born in a nice area. He was an affluent guy. And he says he's an elegant, uh, eloquent man, mighty in scripture. But here's what I look. Verse 25 says, here's the only problem. It says this man has been instructed in the way of the Lord, being fervent in spirit, he spake and taught diligently of the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. In other words, he didn't have Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. Paul had the Holy Ghost. Paul knew who the Holy Ghost was. He was able to speak boldly on who Christ was and that Christ was the Messiah because he had and knew the Holy Ghost. Yes. We find Apollos over here. He is publicly accepted. He's attractive. He's from a good, 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 rich part of society. And they said, but he was useless in the body of Christ because he did not have the Holy Ghost. He didn't know. He just had a good message. He knew some stuff. He had good knowledge. He had some wisdom. Because he knew who Jesus Christ was. He knew John the Baptist. He knew Jesus has been baptized. But what he did not have, and what Jesus says, I will leave you and you must have when I'm gone, he did not have the Holy Ghost. He had only been baptized and knew the baptism of John, which is the water. He hadn't been baptized in the spirit. Right. So Priscilla and Aquila say, you got some, you got some, uh, some, you got some, some skills and ability, but we need to tell you about who God really is. So they say they begun to speak boldly. Some God, when Aquila and Priscilla uh, had heard, they took him uh, and to them and expounded. My Bible says it expounded our. I explain unto him the way of God more perfectly or more accurately. So he says what they did was powerful women now because they explained to him this ain't about how good you speak, Come on now. how well you dress. It's not about what family you come from or where you grew up. Because he grew up in Alexandria. That's not important. But if you really want to be used by God You've got to understand the Holy Ghost. Amen. But see, when you're in a world that's about influence, it's about how good you speak, how you look. It ain't about who you really are. These people say, if you want to be powerful in the body of Christ, if you want to be powerful about the move of God, this is about Holy Ghost. And so they explained that to him. And then they said, and when he was disposed to pass, so now once they get him coached up, once he gets some clarity, understand he can go from being an influencer to now he's ready to be an instrument. He can really be used now. God can use him. His power, his authority, his um, control that he had before was based on where he grew up, where he lived, how he looked, how well he spoke. 
That's great. However, when God want to use you, he don't care about none of that. What he want to know is, do you know my son, Jesus Christ? Are you filled with the Holy Ghost? And if he knows that you could, you got those two things checked off, then he said, now nah, I can use you for the uplifting of my king, not your king. Mm -hmm. It's just ain't about your life. It's ain't about your social media footprint. It's not about you going to market and sell goods and services on your page. That's not important. Do you know the Holy Ghost? You had a Holy Ghost? Mm -hmm. Now I can use you as an instrument for me. Amen. Then we find, and we're going to close in the book of Acts. And I'm going to try not to read all of this, but in your time, read Acts chapter 19. Because after we get my man, Apollos, get him squared away, we come back to Paul again. And now he's in chapter 19 and says this. And it came to pass that while Paul and Apollos was at Corinth, and see, that's the beautiful thing. You see, Apollos and Paul couldn't work together before. Because one was an instrument, one was an influence. Mm -hmm. But now that he's moved from being an influencer to an instrument, now two instruments can play together and make real good music. Come on now, Dave. So he says, okay, now we together. Was in Corinth. Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus and find a uh, certain disciple. He said unto them, have ye received the Holy Ghost? Once again, Paul made about no foolishness. He, first thing he went up, do you have the Holy Ghost? <laughs> you really, you think? Jesus. You about the word of God, you about, you about God's goodness, or you want something else? You about social media likes, you about being an influence, or you about the Holy Ghost? I need to know which, which way you plan this. I know what you want, so I can figure out which angle you want. Then he says, since she believed, and they said, uh, 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 he said, receive the Holy Ghost since she believed. So he said, I understand you say you're a believer, you're in the body of Christ. Do you have the Holy Ghost? Because once again, we're talking about growth now. Just saying, I, I, I know some Bible scriptures, I can quote scripture. That's, that's nice. That's good. We're talking about growth now. We're trying to get the master level understanding. We're not trying to do grade school stuff. So, Paul say, Holy Ghost, do you have it? I know you know some scripture. Then they say this, and they said unto him, we have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. So Paul say, they say, he said Holy Ghost. Some people say, we don't know nothing about that. <laughs> I don't even know if that's true. I know scripture. I can quote scripture. I got good words. I dress nice. I look good. I got, I'm real. I, I'm a great orator. I know God. I know some words. I don't know if that Holy Ghost thing, I don't even know if that's real. I ain't never heard. I don't know nothing about it. Then he says, and said unto them, unto what then were ye baptized? And he says unto John the Baptist. So Lord, he said, Lord, now y'all, he said, Apollos, he, I, and I, I don't, the scripture don't say this. I am embellishing. But he, probably told, he probably told Apollos that he, he probably told Apollos to handle that because Apollos was in the same state. Apollos didn't know the Holy Ghost either. So they say, we don't know about the Holy Ghost thing. And hey, so you know, so Paul say, well, how, who, who were you baptized? And how was <laughs> And then he says, and then Paul said, John, barely uh, John uh, baptized with the baptism of repentance. Saying that the people that they should believe on him which has come after him that is on Jesus. So understand here very clearly what Paul is trying to tell the people. And we've talked about this. Is he pretty much is saying here in verse four, oh, John the Baptist got it. You understand, but the only thing John the Baptist was really teaching and was about was that was about repentance. Mm -hmm. In other words, all you have done is made Jesus your Savior. Come on, man. But we trying to make him your Lord. Amen. So we need to, to get a better understanding. So you, in order for him to be your Lord, you got to have Holy Ghost. Because just being baptized, you've made him your Savior, but he's not your Lord yet. So now he's saying, 
okay, but we got to make him, and that's what they said. Hey, well, we understand John the Baptist. He said, well, oh, all you know about is repentance. Let's move to another level. Let's get him to understand that he's your Lord, not just your Savior. And he says, when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. And all the men were about 12. And he went unto the synagogue and spoke boldly or spake boldly for the space of three months, disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. Now, here's the beauty of it. Apollos was a better speaker. He came from a better uh, background. He was eloquent. Probably would have been accepted better. But Paul, because he has that Holy Ghost, and he understands who he's there for, and because he's weak, and he doesn't speak well, but all he got is the Holy Ghost and the Word of God, he said he spent three months there getting them straight on the Word. Then it says, but when uh, divers, I uh, understand uh, these, these are people uh, who, who did not believe in, in theory, uh, understand that, that uh, were, were, were hardened and believed not, but spake evil of the way before the multitude. He departed from them and separated the disciples, disputing the day, uh, daily in the school, uh, um, uh, daily in the school. So understand, he there for three months, getting them straight in the synagogue, fixing all the crazy stuff that they've been taught, all the stuff the influencers had been saying, all these crazy wild things, the clickbait. He said, let me go fix all that up, give y'all some word on it. And then after a while, he said, but then some in there, they hearts were hard and they didn't want to hear it. So he said, hey, disciples, let's pack up, let's get our stuff, and let's get on away from it. And then it says in verse 10, and this continued by the space of two years. So they, uh, so all they which dwelt in Asia heard of the Lord Jesus, both Jew and Gentile. So understand for two years man, he going around teaching nothing but word, killing all the food. Yeah. Killing all the food. He ain't got time for food. He ain't about no clickbait, no crazy stuff, no great affinity about 85% of Jesus' life was he was out of order. He don't have he I don't have time for that. I'm gonna kill all that. I don't have time for the crazy stuff. But understand what's gonna happen now is Paul, people don't like Paul. He's doing this for two years. People got fed up. They want they want they, they want Paul out of it. And once again, for the sake of time, you're gonna find out that they get themselves uh well, I tell you what, let me just, I want to, I tell you what, Pastor, if you can do me a favor, because I just want to want to close on this. If you can read, and out of your translation, if you can read Acts chapter 19, let's read 24 through, hmm, let's read 24 through 30 and we go on, 24 through 30 and we'll go on. Okay, so uh, Acts chapter 19, verses 24 through 30 from New Living Translation. He called him, he called them together, along with others, employed in similar trades, and addressed them as follows. Gentlemen, you know that our wealth comes from this oh, business. Oh, you started, I'm sorry, did you start at 24? Did you, did you start at 24? Um, 24, yes. Yeah. Am I in the right place? Um, I think so. It just didn't, you didn't, it didn't mention. Acts 19, 24. Yeah, it, it just didn't mention Demetrius and Diana. Uh, but okay. okay. Yeah, go ahead. He began with Demetrius mm -hmm. as a silversmith who had a large business manufacturing silver shrines of the Greek goddess Armenus. He kept many craftsmen busy. He called them together 
along with others employed in similar trades and address them as follows. Gentlemen, you know that our wealth comes from this business, but as you have seen and heard, this man Paul has persuaded many people that handmade gods aren't really gods at all. And he's done this not only here in Ephesus, but throughout the entire province. Of course, I'm not just talking about the loss of public respect for our business. I'm also concerned that the temple of the great goddess Armamus will lose its influence and that Armamus, this magnificent goddess worshipped throughout the province of Asia and all around the world, will be robbed of her great prestige. At this, their anger boiled. And they began shouting, Great is Armatus of the Ephesians. Soon the whole city was filled with confusion. Everyone rushed to the amphitheater, dragging along Gaius and Archus, who were Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia. Paul wanted to go in too, but the believers wouldn't let him. Some of the officials of province, friends of Paul, also sent a message to him, begging him not to risk his life by entering the amphitheater. How far am I going? That's good. You're good right there. I want to close yeah. with this. What we find here is we find Demetrius, that understand they are attacking Paul because they tell you, and I forget which verse you talked about, he says, I'm concerned this man has told these people he's destroying our business. Yes. Because Paul is telling these people that there is only one God. Yes. And, and, and the God, the real God has not, man's hands ain't made him. They were handing out trinkets and people were worshiping this other goddess and they were, he was a silver, a silversmith. He was making these trinkets that people were Just selling false gods, yes. And so uh, you read it in a scripture. He says, I'm not just worried about my business, but we employ a lot of people. He says, you're going to destroy not only me and, and what we're doing, but it's, I employ a lot of people. I have a big footprint. I have a big yes. social media following. I have a big influence financially. Because once again, influencers value and sell goods and services. Mm -hmm. And so he says, this man is going to destroy our economy. You guys are going to lose jobs if you do what he's teaching. If the people no longer believe that these things that we create are really the gods, and this man is, is teaching about this Jesus Christ as is, is, is the Lord and Savior and the, and the only true and only God, he said, he's he going to destroy our business. And so he says, I'm, in, I'm concerned about his influence. In other words, what he was saying was because influencers are concerned and get their power and control from people, he says, I'm worried that this man is going to take away those that we get our power and our control from. Yeah, the God of Artemis. Yes. And so he said, these men have to be dealt with. And so where it gets back to Paul who is an instrument, not an influencer, and they say, uh, Paul, don't even go. It's not safe for you to go there. Don't go. And if you keep reading, you'll find out that these men had to go on trial and, 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 and people wanted to destroy them. But understand, when you at the end of the story, and I'll read verse 41, it says this, and when he had thus spoken, he dismissed the assembly. Understand that these people were trying to destroy them. But because of who they were, because of what they stood on, and the fact that they were instruments of God, and that they weren't standing on their own accord and their own influence, they got away. God is not looking for influencers. Amen. The world looking for influence. God needs and desires instruments so he can use you to, to get people aligned to the influencer, which is him. 
Amen. which is what Paul did. With that, I will close on today with three things. There are simple ways that we can become instruments of God, but it can't be about us. We got to understand that we have to follow Jesus' example in everything we do. Amen. We have to share our experiences in our learnings with others. And then lastly, we have to never hesitate to help those in need. Amen. And if you're doing that, God can make you an instrument. Amen. Amen. He can use you as an instrument. But most importantly, he can't use you if it's about you. Come on now. So with that, I say God bless you. I hope you enjoy the rest of your Sunday. And it is always a pleasure and an honor to be before you. God bless. Amen. Amen. Um, so the doors of the church are open. If you like to join the church or join the body of Christ, we're, we're not going to go through the what we would normally do. I'm just the doors are open. You 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 know where your heart is, or if you just want to rededicate, you know your life back to the Lord as we've been doing on this morning. The doors are open, and you're always welcome to join the join the body of Christ, and you're always welcome to join this church or. And prayerfully, any church, we just recommend that you get into a church that's really going to preach and teach you the word of God and, and under a shepherd that's going to follow the voice of God. Amen. Um, and then now there's an opportunity to give. Uh, Leander will show the slide for giving. Thank you guys who are giving. I can see that, you know, uh, sometimes it comes through tidally, comes through cash app. We, you know, we see it. Uh, and you guys have been been doing so great, giving unto the Lord. We it really, I, I've been, I've noticed a difference ever since, you know, we 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 taught earlier this year about the gift of giving, and not talking about tithes, you know, but talking about offering because we know that we're not under the law of tithing. And ever since God brought that word forth, th you know, through uh, giving has been up, and and that's just how God is when you do things His way. He always improves upon everything. He's so good. They're just, just, he's just so, he's such an amazing, amazing God. And there's nothing too hard for, for him. Amen. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessings that there will not be room enough to store it. Ways to give, as you see on your screen, um, is uh, we have our website at www.asgcc.church. We also have our cash app, which is uh, dollar sign ASGCC, and you'll see the church emblem there. Um, you have to download the app if you don't have it. We also have the Tively app where you can go on and lo uh, locate our church's Awesomeness of God Christian Church or you can send a uh, check or money order to P.O. Box 1592, Riverview, Florida, 33578. Amen. Thank you. As far as our announcements, um, we would love to have everyone at our Wednesday night Bible study at 7 o'clock. Bring a friend um, and come prepared mm -hmm. to digest and and break down the bible in a way that is fun and that we can understand it so that we may be able to carry that word with us and use it in our in our lives in a way as i mentioned we can understand it so again wednesday night bible studies at 7 p.m and our regular church services start on sundays at 10 a.m thank you for our morning announcements and i will lead us out in prayer Father, we thank you right now in the name of Jesus. We thank you for switching up this, this service this morning. And we yes, ask Lord, you, Lord. that you just bless everyone on this call right now with what it is they need, Father. Give us the patience, Father, to, to have us to wait 
and, and have it be done in your in your time, Father. Yes. Lord, everything is perfect when it's done in your time. And we say thank you right now. We thank just you. ask for those patience, Father. Lord, we ask, Lord, that you just bless our families on this call. Yes. And we just bless just our lives in general. We thank you, Lord, for thank what you. you have blessed us with so far, Father. And even if you choose never to bless us again, we oh, say thank come you. Come on Lord. now. Thank you. We Lord. thank you right now in the name of Jesus, Lord. Lord, you're an awesome God and so, so worthy to be praised. Yes. And we say thank you, Lord. Thank you. We Lord. thank you, Lord, for this church, Lord. And we ask, Lord, that you just continue to bless us and the church, Lord. In yes. Jesus' name we pray, Lord. Amen. 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 And 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 I'll just say we're studying the book of Nehemiah on Wednesday nights. And it is an awesome, it is an awesome study about um leadership, you know, godly leadership. So if you we're on chapter six, I believe, coming up this week. If you want to read ahead and then join us. Love you guys and to God be the glory. Remember, it is well.